um, how how poverty is bad because it poisons the brain. And in one sense, you know, brain's recognition to poverty is being bad, um, but to use an absurd comparison, it's like saying we need to know that slavery poisons the brain to know slavery is bad. And that's not um, not what it should do. That's a research paradigm. But nonetheless, to recognition of quality, um, and I can hear the work of Richard Wilkinson, uh, that it can have impact not just on the poorest, but across the societies, societies that are more unequal, um, are societies that overall are less healthy than comparable societies that have more, more equality, it is certainly a finding that bears out um, in developed countries and increasingly in countries that are going to rapid development. If you look at some of the most unequal countries in the world, they are countries, some of them like Colombia, that uh, exist in the developing world where neo liberal economic structures have come in, where there have been traditional elites, and those meet and really exacerbate um, inequality in those countries. And so I have, a, have a, a big concern about the intersection of inequality with um, the social processes that we you know play such a fundamental role in chronic non communicable diseases as well as in mental and behavioral health. Now, a closer look at the coconut uh, fruit that is grown on Nauru and across most of the Pacific Islands on palm trees uh, is one way in which to look at the early colonial influence. So not only the influence of um, colonial settlers, but also the influence of the economic system and systems of trade that accompanied their, um, their arrival in Nauru. Now, writing in 1921, Rowan spoke of the coconut as solely the most important tree on Nauru, linking it to wealth, rank, and land value. Now, this is in contrast to earlier records, such as those of Hambrook and Stephen, which emphasized the centrality of pandanus in Nauruan life and in the landscape. Now, pandanus is a fruit that ripens every nine months, and in the past, um, the Nauruan people had a really complex process of preservation that allowed them to store pandanus fruit pro products for up to six years at a time. So it provided an incredible food source, not only in the present, but also a source of food that allowed them to um, buffer the harsh climatic conditions on the small island. Now, it's likely that the coconut increased in importance and that coconut groves were planted in place of pandanus along the coastline as the copra export trade was expanded by German authorities in the late 1800s. Now, copra is a form of dried coconut, which in the past was used as oil for oil lamps and things like that. And it was an incredibly lucrative um, uh, a trading product in the in the period and in the region. Now, prior to formal annexation by Germany in 1888, but after ships had reg uh, kind of regularly begun to land in Nauru, there were mixed forms of currency used on the island, with coconut being the predominant currency. So. Um, a Winchester rifle, for example, could be purchased for 30,000 coconuts and a bottle of square gin cost around 500 coconuts. So by this time, coconuts were not simply a food source for Nauruans, but also an economic unit used in barter and exchange with foreigners. And in a way, growing coconuts was almost like growing money. Um, now changes in the landscape, the changes from, from, um, from pandanus trees to, to more and more coconut groves, suggest that the value ascribed to pandanus trees by Nauruans was decreasing relative to that ascribed to the coconut tree and the imported goods that coconuts could provide. And there's been another shift since then, since the mining industry really took hold. A lot of the coconut groves have since been um, turned into mined land because the phosphate has become more significant than the coconut. And indeed, the profits from the phosphate can then be used to purchase food. So as a result of the increasing importance on coconut trees, the capacity to enter into trade via coconuts or money would have begun to change factors, both social and resource linked, constraining the Nauruan diet. I'm Carrie hawk -Lassard. I'm United Remnant Band Shawnee, and I'm an applied medical anthropologist. I want to start by reading you a quote from this book by Vine Deloria, Jr., now, I could think of a lot of exotic experiences that Indians could provide for wandering college students with a summer to kill, but it's damn depressing to realize that your tribe exists 
at the sufferance of a society because it can be experienced. Being merely an experience with nothing more to contribute than a few exciting pages in a diary creates an incredible gap between Indian people and others that cannot be bridged easily. American Indians are the ultimate other. We're a bit of mythic wildness that exists in one of the most highly developed places on the earth, but that's almost based entirely on fantasy. The image of American Indians has been reinvented, reimagined, reiterated so many times and under the colonial gaze, and yet we as a people have had very little voice in that image. Uh, we've been almost entirely erased from the process. We're trapped in an amber, sort of as relics, um, and that constrains our present. Outsiders are always quick to speak for us, as if we are incapable of doing so ourselves. And what they say is nearly never what we would say if we were to speak for ourselves. The sad reality, though, is that the colonial voice often has more currency and more authority than our voice, than the voice of indigenous people that's been so muted for generations, for, for generations. It shouldn't be so surprising then that when persons, perhaps well-meaning persons, experience our culture, it really is an intrusion into the real lives of real people. So think of a film like Dances with Wolves that really captured the public imagination. And it brought scores of tourists to communities in Pine Ridge and Rosebud. But we're not a tourist attraction. We're people just going about our daily lives. Um, think of the photographs of National Geographic's Aaron Huey and the conflict that this caused in Indian country. On the one hand, you have people saying, finally, you know, the, the realities of our people are, are being spoken to. And then other people saying, we've been crying about these realities for how long now? And finally, with the imprimatur of a white photographer, finally it has meaning. And it's very frustrating. Uh, I would say the next time that you think of taking my picture, when I've got my chinupa out and I'm praying at wounded knee, just don't. Know your place. Negotiating shifts in market economies and subsistence economies in Maya villages in southern Belize is handled with more um, difficulty um, by some than by others. For many, it is a source of great stress to find that reciprocal arrangements for planting corn or building a house, for example, um, requests to provide reciprocal labor are now met with um, requests from friends and family members for cash payment um, instead of payment in kind or returning back the day, um, which is how um, labor was traditionally organized in my villages, where you would call on someone to help you and then return back the day of labor to those people that um, helped you. This, this shift for um, desire for cash instead of um, help with labor um, was described by several people that um, I worked with and interviewed as um, a disappointment, um, as people forgetting their traditions, forgetting what it meant to be Maya, to not um, provide this reciprocal transaction. Um, we help each other something that I heard quite a lot. We help each other by returning back the day, by coming and providing labor, and then you, in turn, getting that labor in return. So this idea that um, people need money, and they do, um, the market economy is present, but the degree to which people engage in the market economy, um, and the degree to which they engage in it um, comfortably or willingly, or successfully, however you might define success, and, and that's um, the subject of a very long video, I'm sure, um, whether we define success um, in, a, in an economic sense, um, which is how we might define it um, coming from our culture, um, what provides the, the highest income, the highest return um, for inputs of labor. Or success meaning more um, in terms of um, social interactions and um, social um, equities, I suppose, um, is a way to put 
that. So um, the success that comes in terms of the social interac interactions and the um, through the reciprocity or reciprocal labor arrangement, um, I would argue and I found um, through my research to be significant um, factors in determining people's overall well-being and wellness, um, how they were able to um, interact socially um, in even in an economic arrangement. Now, Nauru was annexed by German authorities in the late 1800s and from that time onwards, especially um, with the intrusion of colonial authorities and also with the, um, with the coming of long-term missionaries um, to the island, food practices began to change. Uh, lots of different types of preserved food in particular were imported into the country because they could be kept for long periods on ships and, and imported to the island. Now, at the same time, this was a period in which preserved foods and tinned foods more generally were, were being um, developed and adopted in Britain and in the colonies of Britain as these foods became cheaper and more accessible to the middle classes. Um, some of the biggest canning industries in the Oceania region, so in Australia and New Zealand in particular, which were exporting to Nauru, um, went from being um, industries which canned food in order to preserve it for the military or for the use of the upper classes to industries that began to specialise more and more in in single crops or in the production of, of single products. And this meant that um, they had more and more left over and more and more that would otherwise go to waste. And so canning and preserving of foods really took on a second um, role, not only a role, not only did it have a role in kind of providing nutrition to to people all over the world, but it also had a role in in um, in the business model insofar as it allowed these companies to use their their excess products um, and to be able to market something that would otherwise be uh, wasted or or not be able to be consumed because of the way in which farming was changing. So these kind of products were taken to Nauru and the local population began to, to consume them in, in large quantities really at the end of the 1800s, beginning of the 1900s. And there are some, some really clever descriptions of, of feasts um, at the time. For example, um, uh, a feast for a chief's first, uh, the, menstrua the first menstruation of a chief's daughter so this combination of trying to understand actionable items as well as um, how things like loneliness, um, which you're not recognizing is not just feeling, but impacts you biologically, impacts your social networks. Anyways, it's much worse than, dis um, than stress. Um, to recognize how inequality worsens loneliness, but loneliness, in a sense, increases the impact of inequality particularly in social environments marked by the sort of rapid development we've seen where traditional structures of social networks are, are rapidly transforming as well. Things are changing from uh, one type of capital to another. And so I think we can use these more micro lenses actually to illuminate larger scale processes. And that's, that's an exciting area, not just for me going forward, but I hope as a whole is to, to get at these processes that sort of are in between an individual level and a societal level um, in ways that are all of the long-term holistic promise. Now, most of the resource that is phosphate has since been mined out and um, the mines have largely been exhausted and at the same time, the investments that were being made with Neuron's money were were a bit questionable and the country experienced a fairly significant economic collapse at the end of the 1990s and the beginning of the 2000s. And it's starting to come out of that period now, but at the same time, 
um, is certainly not nearly as wealthy as it was before. And that's really interesting for me because it meant that the people that I met in Nauru, some of the oldest people that I met had lived through um, colonial occupation and colonial rule. They experienced the Second World War and occupation by Japanese forces for five years on the island. They'd experienced political independence and a great deal of wealth and prosperity that came with the, the mining boom. And they've experienced an economic collapse and now relative hardship. And younger generations have only experienced parts of that. So people have all grown up in very different, not only economic concept, uh, kind of um, uh, situations, but also um, very different social settings um, with very different um, influences around them, both cultural and social and and um, and that leads to some really interesting intergenerational differences in the country. This stress um, that's felt by many in terms of, of um, having to come up with cash in order to get things done um, is also mirrored in this idea that um, the market economy requires um, you to do work that produces cash. So in order to get cash, you have to farm more. And then as a result, you're subject to um, commodity prices. So if you um, work hard and you grow a lot of rice, and the government decides that they're not gonna buy a lot of rice, um, then you're in that position of being stuck. In that position of being stuck, um, entering the market economy and growing um, uh, new crops for sale is a is a story that's um, seen throughout the world. Okay. This shift from subsistence crops to cash crops um, puts people in, in a position where they're at the mercy of world markets. And I've definitely seen that in my research in southern Belize, particularly with rice um, and people trying to grow it for cash and being unsuccessful. Um, is this type of exclusion and of suffering that we wanted to export to the rest of the world? What makes us believe that our way of living and of treating others within our own communities and, and that our economic functioning um, is better than, than what others have to offer, that what is in place elsewhere? Um, people suffer tremendously within our own borders and their health is compromised, their abilities are untapped and unused for the common good. Uh, in fact, illegality and negative behaviors are promoted by this exclusion. There is a lot more that I could say about this and numerous examples of how problematic our definitions of success and of development are. I can sort of get a job sometimes you have a palanca connection to get you into these, these kids that often burn those bridges um, in their lives are trying to rebuild them at and back those sorts of things. And so they couldn't really draw on traditional means on you know, the same time that, uh, that the institutional setup also was very uh, difficult for them. There's no understanding that, uh, say you might put in the United States, that addiction can be a chronic relapsing disorder. Um, that's something get over on the uh, long-term care um, social guidance uh, and that contrast between a social institution like the treatment community where they really didn't have problems uh, and then going back to a social situation which in a sense brought back all these behavioral issues that they had long had, um, the frustrations they had in their families, the frustrations they had with law enforcement, was uh, in many ways it was heartbreaking because you would see them do so well and say, well, if there were institutional means outside the treatment community to do this sort of work, these kids would be just fine. And then once you're back in the community, um, you know, the way the structure of the institution was they would have to come to us. Um, hard to get to them, they're all spread out throughout the city, and that sort of impact uh, 
that, that contrast between different spaces in our social lives that you see in, uh, in modern uh, urban spaces, where you have very different social lives you put in on uh, spaces, wasn't something that helped them. And to understand not just the, the sense of that you need social capital to be able to work in these institutions, but that these social environments they had acted in the sense uh, at the treatment community they were in a space where the habits they built up with a long time were repressed in a sense and they had other avenues for moving forward in their lives. And when they've lost those things outside the community, these habits they had built up often re-expressed themselves. And this is based on research from that comes on attachment studies as well as addiction studies. And so they're the social side of things, uh, as much as anything, played a, uh, a central role in relapse. And it wasn't really that it was relapse because of some individual failing, but because of how social institutions um, weren't meeting these kids where they were at. In particular, I was able to see the importance of these ideas while working with a group of low-income African-American kids um, with whom I conducted my doctoral research in Sulphur Springs, Tampa. Um, these kids and members of their families desired to be part of the society which relegated them to the margins. Um, they felt the frustration um, from not having access to the privileges that they saw available to others. The possibilities for these kids and their families were minimal. Um, they lacked good health, proper nutrition, a stable home place, and were surrounded by great, great violence. Many of them then resorted to alternative and illegal um, economies that allow them to consume in the way uh, that society demands um, to be a part of it, even if only superficially, um, you know, be a part of this, this world that is sold uh, to them and to us. Um, through television and, and other media programming. Um, they wanted to be successful in the way our society defines the, the concept of success. At the same time, a group of elders, um, community artists within the community, uh, saw to, they saw the, these issues and, and the frustration of these kids and the path the negative path that they were uh, following, and they sought to instill in them a different vision of life, a spiritual path that could help them to keep at bay the pressures of uh, consumerism, to allow them to create and to see uh, different possibilities, um, different from what they were offered by society. Um, and so they did this through, um, the, um, through art, and through spirituality, teaching them, um, teaching the kids to be creative, um, giving them a purpose um, in life, showing them a different uh, path that could reduce or eliminate the suffering that they felt uh, from, from the exclusion um, that they were um, subjected to. And the conundrum, basically, is how families are going to provide this opportunity. And high school becomes um, a source of stress in a couple of different ways. Um, the first way is that high school requires a certain amount of um, money and with which to purchase uniforms and books. Um, in some cases, transportation, if school buses are unreliable and they don't arrive on time to take students to school. Um, they also require money for the purchase of food and lunches um, at school. And this is kind of an interesting stressor because students that are attending high school are reluctant to take a packed lunch from home. Um, the idea of packing tortillas um, is socially um, something that many students don't want to do. They feel self-conscious about having tortillas when other students from different parts of the town or other villages um, may not share their dietary habits. Um, so that's a stressor. It's also a stressor on mothers um, if they were to pack the tortillas 
um, to wake up at the hour that they needed to wake up to prepare um, and grind and prepare tortillas for students to pack for their lunch fresh and to catch the school bus and travel um, the hour or more to get to school. So it's a financial stressor um, in, in all of these ways, a sort of social stressor in terms of um, this issue of lunch. It's also um, a pressure on the community in terms of these um, teenage um, students being absent um, in a work day. So there's a lot of um, work that would normally be done by students who have uh, left primary school but who are not attending high school. Um, for boys, work in the farm, um, work around the house, um, for girls. And so it leaves um, mothers and fathers um, with a lot of um, work to do in order to provide for these students, um, both financially, but also in terms of their food, in terms of the household work and chores, um, and the maintenance of the, the home and the farm um, without these students um, who are spending long days um, out of their village and away at high school. Now, parallel to the hospital and further away is a program called the Forest People's Program. The Forest People's Program is based out of Britain and it is run by anthropologists. And I discovered this uh, while I was in Uganda, but interacted with the anthropologists much later and they have done amazing advocacy work with the Batwa and so they work in a different part of the forest a bit further south and the, their perspective is they want to empower the Batwa to be able to determine what they want for themselves which is to regain access to the forest and regain you know to perhaps be able to forage in some of the the multiple use grounds and because right now if a botwa goes back into the forest they are there are reports of people being beaten and killed and the people who run the tours for the mountain gorillas are not botwa they are imported from um the the eastern end of uganda they have to have a high school education so they have to speak English. The Batwa are not allowed to give any tours of the forest. The majority of these families are, uh, you know, their incomes are pretty limited. But the way that the school operates is it's a sliding scale. It's a not-for-profit school. And it is incorporated into the National Secretary of Education in, in Mexico. But um, it's mostly run by private and corporate donors. So parents and families pay tuition, but on a sliding scale. There are different sorts of stories um, that are not simply this idea of students leaving and leaving their families in distress. And while elders um, talk about how when students go away to high school and they go into the town and they're away all day, they're wearing their clean white school socks, and they don't want to um, go to the farm anymore, and they don't want to get dirty, and they don't want their traditions. And I heard this um, from elders um, over and over again. Um, I also heard from young high school graduates, um, people in their early 20s and late teens, that have been decided to come back to their village after a high school education and continue to farm, understanding that farming is um, a kind of entrepreneurial endeavor. Um, so there's a combination of ways to view it. Um, there are those young people who um, are able to take um, temporary jobs that require a high school degree to make a little extra money, but still maintain a farm and to still live in the village and maintain close links with the village. But there are others who choose to go out and um, sort of fulfill the elders um, observation that that when you attend high school that you don't want um, your traditions and your traditional farming practices and you lose those skills and you gain other skills that may or may not be useful um, in terms of the availability of the kinds of jobs that um, a high school degree provides the skills um, to get. Rick Wolf writes a lot about the fact that uh, 
the sort of bust and boom cycles that come along with engagement in a globalized economy, uh, are, they're cyclical. It's something that has uh, waxed and waned. If you even look at specific commodities like cacao, for example, uh, was you know, very dominant in the region in the 1920s. Uh, it, for many reasons, uh, declined. It hit an, an, another sort of peak in the mid 20th century and then declined again. And then more recently as uh, organic uh, sort of shade grown cacao has become uh, in vogue as an, a global commodity again, then you know prices are, are very high again. So it's, it's a very cyclical thing. And the idea of seeing engagement with the global economy as a, a one-way process is, uh, is really not very accurate. Uh, and the, uh, the choices that families make to engage or not engage with uh, these types of commodities is one that uh, should be, I guess, approached with caution in the sense of making grand explanations about uh, patterns that are emerging. But uh, one of the things that, that I have noticed in my own uh, research in the area is that uh, there is definitely a trend towards mobility uh, in um, creating what I've often referred to as a mosaic of Maya livelihood practices. So the idea is that people create a, um, a, a way of life through a very complex patchwork of approaches that includes subsistence farming, dooryard gardening, uh, wage labor of all, all different descriptions, uh, pursuing education, and um, all of these are, are kind of uh, pursued uh, in concert with one another. And at times, depending on what's happening with uh, the global economy, people have kind of uh, moved further out away from subsistence far farming or further back towards it. Uh, and in a recent article, um, I made the observation that in response to the uh, global food crisis in uh, 2007 and 2008, a lot of people were returning to farming after a period of moving away from it uh, because it was more predictable to be able to, to grow your own food um, for a few years than it was to uh, secure a job to be able to, to pay for that food. So I guess the take home message here is that um, when we think about particularly engagement in global economies, there seems to be a, a real lack of uh, historical time depth in the perspective that's often taken, as if this is a, a new, very recent process, when in, in fact it's been going on uh, since colonial times. So carefully tracing those connections uh, and how they shape experiences today is something that anthropologists and other researchers uh, have really demonstrated as being extremely important in understanding what the ways to the future are. The subsistence farmer, in some respects, I would argue, is being recast um, by the farmers themselves, young farmers, as a manifestation of a new entrepreneurship. So if you're a young subsistence farmer, you have all the um, freedoms of being your own boss and um, working for yourself. Um, one of my research participants told me, I boss myself. Why would I want to go work for someone when I boss myself? If I want to lie in the hammock, I can lie in the hammock. If I work hard, then I grow a lot and I have extra to sell and I have my money. But I am in charge of that. So this rhetoric, um, I would like to call it the new entrepreneur rhetoric um, surrounding um, a, a traditional farming system, which was a subsistence farming system. So you have these, this entrepreneurial element from, from what we understand as sort of market economics, but you have this, um, this understanding that, that subsistence farming, um, you reap the, the rewards of your labor in terms of the food you provide your family, um, the social relationships that you build, um, while you're um, providing that food and um, your free time being your own. So I feel like this is um, significant to note, especially um, as part of this discussion, that these elements from what we call the past or this traditional subsistence farming 
system, which has evolved, traditional being um, as it is a bit of a misnomer. But this system that has evolved over hundreds and thousands of years um, isn't archaic in terms of interacting with the market economy. It doesn't necessarily have to butt heads with um, you know, these global economic philosophies. It actually can um, work within that system and be valuable um, these traditional practices and ideas about um, how to govern a farm and how to you know, um, use reciprocal labor and return it back. These things can be recast um, and, and used um, to enter um, and, and be successful in a global economy.